Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The topic of today's lecture is the disorders of sweat glands. And in this lecture, I will be mainly discussing hyperhidrosis. Eccrine glands. The human eccrine sweat glands have two distinct functions. They allow body cooling by evaporation, which is an adaptation to hot environment. And number two, they moisten the skin on palm and soles and thus improve their grip. The eccrine sweat glands are distributed all over the body, including the glands penis and the foreskin. However, there are a few exceptions where the sweat glands are not present. And these areas are the lips, external ear canal, clitoris, and labia minora. Anatomy of eccrine glands. Sweat glands vary in size from person to person. All the sweat glands develop at birth and after birth, there is no new eccrine gland development. The sweat glands are morphologically normal at birth, but may not function properly until two years of age. The gland consists of a secretory coil in the lower dermis and subcutaneous tissue and a duct that is leading through the dermis and through the epidermis. The apoecrine glands have features of both eccrine and apocrine glands, but seems to be nearer to the eccrine gland in function. And these glands are mainly present in the axilla, where they contribute to about 10 to 45% of the axillary glands. Physiology of eccrine glands. The maximal individual eccrine gland secretion range from 2 to 20 nanoliter per minute per gland. The function of coil is to produce from plasma a watery isotonic, isotonic secretion that is modified further as the secretion passes through the eccrine ducts. Acetylcholine passively increase the entry of sodium into the cell and this is then pumped out by the sodium pump into the intercellular canaliculi. The fluid secretion in the eccrine gland is believed to be mediated osmotically. The aquaporins are a group of intercellular membrane water channel proteins which allow the movement of large amount of fluid through the ducts. The duct in one third of the coil consists of two or more layer of relatively uniform cuboidal cells, which is the secretory epithelium. The intraepidermal sweat unit is lined by specialized cells, which are although different from the epidermal cells, but may not be easy to distinguish. Sweat glands do not cool the skin only by evaporation uh, from the surface, but they also act as the heat pipes. Visualization of sweating may be achieved by indicators that become colored on contact with water from the sweat. And such is the starch iodine test or bromophenol blue or quinazirin. The starch iodine test, which is the most commonly used test to determine the sweating, is done by first drying the skin and painting it with 2% povidine iodine and then allow it to get dry. Then we put a little starch iodine powder or the um, uh, normal starch powder or the corn flour directly onto the skin. As the sweating develops or occurs, this starch powder turns into black and where the sweating is maximal, the color will be more prominent. So this is 
the starch iodine test done on the axillary skin and you can see the brown or black specks are the point of maximum sweat secretion. Control of acrine sweating. There is a central control and there is a local control. So central control is um, the central and peripheral changes in temperature influence the thermal receptors present in the pre-optic areas and anterior hypothalamus. Increase in core temperature activates the cooling mechanisms that include sweating, panting, and vasodilatation. Osmotic factors also influence the rate of sweat production. Both hyperosmolality and hypovolemia decrease the sweat production. Center and pathway controlling the mental sweating are not fully known. But areas within the frontal region of brains have been identified. So these mental stimuli, such as stress or emotions, enhance sweating production, particularly from the palm and soles at the time of stress. Then the local control. Although the stimulation of adrigen, uh, adrenergic nerves increase sweating, this is much less than response to the cholinergic stimulation. In addition, vasoactive intestinal amines, uh, peptides, VIP, calcitonin gene-related peptide, and nitric oxide play some role in control of acrine sweating. Other factors that modify the quality and quantity of sweat includes the hormones, circulatory changes, axon and spinal reflexes. Sweat coils also contain the androgen receptors. And this androgen is partly responsible for increased sweating in and around puberty in males as compared to female. Acrine sweating. The most important constituents of the acrine sweat is sodium, chloride, potassium, urea, and lactate. Sweat is hypotonic and thus this is largely due to the resorption of sodium into the duct. At increased sweat rate, sodium concentration rises, presumably because there is a reduced time for ductal reabsorption. So when the sweating is increased, the content of uh, sodium in sweat increases. Aldosterone can increase the ductal sodium reabsorption and in Addison's disease, high sodium can be demonstrated. A raised level of chloride in sweating above 60 millimoles per liter is considered consistent with cystic fibrosis. Lactate is found in concentration of 4 to 40 and the excess is found uh, in plasma, which is an excess to that in plasma. High sweat glucose may be found in uncontrolled diabetes and this is mainly the reason of creating a favorable environment on the surface for secondary infections. pH of sweat is uh, acidic, that is around 4 to 6.8. Active excretion and secretion of drugs such as grisofulvin and ketoconazole contribute to the efficacy of these drugs um, because these drugs are excreted in the sweat. Now, the main topic of today's lecture, that is hyperhidrosis. Hyperhidrosis is defined as the excessive production of sweat that is more than required for the thermoregulation. So it is the excess of sweat secretion beyond the thermoregulation. It can be defined uh, gravimetrically as greater than two standard deviations above the mean value of sweat secretion. So in palm, 50 milligram per minute per meter square, planter skin, 50 milligram per minute per meter square and axillary skin, 150 milligram per minute per meter square and facial skin, 50 milligram per minute per meter square. The generalized and focal nevoid hyperhidrosis are rare presentations and there is no gender or racial preponderance to hyperhidrosis. The hyperhidrosis can be classified as a generalized hyperhidrosis 
focal hyperhidrosis, which include palmar, plantar, axillary, and craniofacial. Then the localized nevoid hyperhidrosis, a compensatory hyperhidrosis, and hyperhidrosis with extensive anhydrosis, the Ross syndrome. Generalized hyperhidrosis, pathophysiology. An increase in temperature of blood bathing the hypothalamus increase heat loss by sweating and vasodilatation. This is the normal mechanism and this mechanism get exaggerated in generalized hyperhidrosis. In stability of sweat regulating center is caused by many febrile illnesses and this instability may persist for days or months after the fever has subsided. And this is known as the sweating sickness. Causes of generalized hyperhidrosis. The thermoregulatory sweating occur during or after many infective processes, which include malaria, tuberculosis, brucellosis, lymphoma, subacute bacterial endocarditis, etc. And night sweats are often part of the clinical picture. A similar mechanism accounts for hyperhidrosis that is associated with alcohol intoxication or gout or after vomiting. Generalized hyperhidrosis may be associated with diabetic autono autonomic neuropathy, hyperthyroidism, hyperpituitarism, hypoglycemia, obesity, menopause, and malignant diseases. So there is a huge list of conditions that are associated with generalized hyperhidrosis. Combination of patchy anhydrosis and compensatory hyperhidrosis has been documented in patients with Parkinson's disease, suggesting some autonomic dysfunctions. Paroxysmal sweating, tachycardia, and headaches strongly suggest pheochromocytoma, and hypertension is also noted during the attack. Hyperhidrosis is seen in association with peripheral neuropathies, as familial dysautonomia or relay day syndrome. The generalized hyperhidrosis may be associated with brain lesions, diencephalic lesions, malformation of corpus callosum, and microgyria. And this is sometimes accompanied by episodic hypothermia. Uh, drugs like floxetine is able to cause generalized hyperhidrosis. Then focal hyperhidrosis. Focal hypohidrosis include palmoplantar hyperhidrosis, axillary and craniofacial or emotional hyperhidrosis. The emotional or mental activities increase the sweating, especially on palm and soles, in axilla, and to lesser extent in groin, faces and scalp. The thermal stimuli and physical effort increase this effect in many cases. Clinical features. The focal hyperhidrosis may be significant disability and embarrassment, particularly if sweat drips from the hands onto the floor, resting the metal objects may be an occupational problem, and clothings may be saturated and stained. Patients with axillary hyperhidrosis often wear only black or white garments as these show the wetness, show less wetness than the colored clothes. So this is also a limitation. Hyperhidrosis may be associated with Raynaud's phenomenon and reflex sympathetic dystrophy or may follow a cold injury. Frequently, there is a family history of excessive sweating. So the tendency of excessive sweating may run in families. Then few words about palmoplantar hyperhidrosis, which is the most common presentation we come across. This occur in both sexes and commonly begin at childhood or around the puberty. The sweating of palm and soles may be either continuous or phasic and when continuous, it is worse in summer. When phasic, is, it is usually precipitated by minor emotional or mental activity and is not markedly different in summer and in winter. Hands may be cold and show tendency to acrocinosis. 
Hyperhidrosis may affect hand, feet and axilla in any combination. When this is associated with vasomotor changes, so that the sodden skin is cold and cyanotic, the name is symmetrical lividity. The palmoplantar hyperhidrosis is often a component of various syndromes associated with palmoplantar keratoderma and it occurs with nail patella syndrome. So you can see the extent of hyperhidrosis of palm and soles may be sometimes very extensive. So it is associated with complications and comorbidities like uh, palmoplantar hyperhidrosis predisposes to vesicular eczema like pomphilix and allergic sensitization to footwear. Maceration of skin in toe clefts predisposes to both dermatophytes and bacterial infections. Pitted keratolysis of feet due to infection with keratoconus sedentarius. So all these infections are associated with hyperhidrosis. Then a few words about axillary hyperhidrosis. This may be continuous or phasic as palmoplantar hyperhidrosis and may or may not be aggravated by heat or mental activity. This is uncommon before puberty. The axillary sweating on undressing is very common. The axillary hyperhidrosis is due to overactivity of eccrine glands, unlike the axillary odor, which is mainly apocrine in origin. So this is different. The odor is apocrine while the hyperhidrosis is eccrine. Then craniofacial hyperhidrosis. Craniofacial hyperhidrosis is often physic, occur in middle age, and is exacerbated by heat, exercise, and eating. But unlike the true gustatory hyperhidrosis, not exclusively so. So it is not must that craniofacial hyperhidrosis occurs only at the time of eating. It, is, it has an emotional component as well. It may be persistent and usually present at later age than the palmoplantar hyperhidrosis. The entire face and scalp may be affected and sweating may be sufficient to soak the hairs and which cause additional embarrassment. This is, you can see the sweat, uh, sweat uh, blebs at uh, the forehead, droplets. Then focal hyperhidrosis, disease course and prognosis. Hyperhidrosis may persist for some years but there is a tendency to spontaneous improvement of both axillary and palmar hydrosis after 25 years of age. So it is mainly a disease starting from puberty and ending by 25 or 26 years of age. Investigation. We thyroid function test and gravimetrical determination of sweating is rarely required but should be performed. The other test that, sh that should be done for uh, unusual hyperhidrosis include exclusion of pheochromocytoma, exclusion of uh, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. The localized hyperhidrosis occur in spinal cord injuries, in intrathoracic neoplasms, as a result of gustatory hyperhidrosis, in Frey syndrome, in granulosis rubra nasi. We will be discussing that in compensatory uh, after sympathectomy, sweating is associated with local skin disorders like glomangioma, the blue rubber blab nevus, pachydermoperiostitis, pretibial myxedema, and burning feet syndrome. It is idiopathic, unilateral, and circumscribed, and there may be functional and true sweat gland nevi. The localized circumscribed and asymmetrical hyperhidrosis uh, may uh, occur reflexly from a visceral disturbance adjacent to an area of anhydrosis or due to axon reflex stimuli around a leg ulcer or around a glomus tumor and blue bre rubber bleb nevi or pseudoparous angiomas. So these all are the conditions which are associated with localized or circumscribed hyperhidrosis. Compensatory hyperhidrosis occur in normal sweat glands when those elsewhere are not functioning because of the neurological or skin disease, diabetes, or after sympathetic. 
It is also a component of Ross syndrome. We'll discuss this. Area of skin may be localized, termed as idiopathic circumscribed hyperhidrosis. It may represent a functional sweat gland nevi, where the eccrine gland show increased sensitivity to cholinergic neurotransmitter. In absence of other neurological symptoms or sign, they are seldom a manifestation of progressive neurological lesion. Cold-induced sweating syndrome. A rare condition present in infancy with poor feeding and difficulty in suckling, followed in adulthood by paradoxical cold-induced hyperhidrosis and anhydrosis in heat. So the effects become paradoxical. Heating causes anhydrosis and cold causes hyperhidrosis. It is associated with mild neuropathy, kyphoscoliosis, the valgus deformity of elbows, high arch palate, and digital syndactyly. The inactivation of cardiotropin like cytokinines have been identified as a cause of this syndrome. Gustatory hyperhidrosis. This is precipitated by eating hot spicy food and occur physiologically in many people. Occurs pathological condition uh, pathologically when involving the autonomic nervous system, and the commonest cause is diabetes. It is also seen in damage to sympathetic nerves around head and neck, leading to abnormal connections. Thus, the reflex arcs that allow chewing or taste stimuli to cause parotid and gustatory secretions may also cause sweating in localized distribution. So with the damage of sympathetic nerves around head and neck, saliva as well as sweating occurs concomitantly. The commonest site of distribution is auriculotemporal nerves, submental gustatory sweating following injury of cauda tympani, and greater auricular nerve following radical neck surgery. Injury to fibers of vagus nerve after cervical sympathectomy cause sweating localized to upper arms. Clinical feature, 50 to 80% of patients are subjected to operations on parotid glands. Symptoms appear four to seven months after the operation and the stimuli that is required for this gustatory hyperhidrosis include chewing even without the taste sensation. Olfactory hyperhidrosis is a trigger, um, trigger stimuli is smell. This has also been recorded. Management. Treatment of severe cases requires surgical interruption of the parasympathetic pathway, for example, sections of glossopharyngeal nerves within the skull or tympanic neurectomy. Topical therapies with aluminum chloride, topical glycopyronium, bromide, or botulinum toxin may be helpful. So now we discuss the management of hyperhidrosis. First, the topical drug treatment. Several topical anticholinergic drugs are used. Atropine-like drugs may be absorbed sufficiently to produce a beneficial local effect without associated systemic effects. The, uh, the poldine metosulfate, 1 to 4% in alcohol, suppresses the experimentally induced sweating. Then topical 0.5% glycopyronium bromide cream is successfully used in gustatory hyperhidrosis in diabetics, and 2.2% cream is used for axillary and scalp hyperhidrosis. Then eccrine duct blocking drugs. Formalin 40% aqueous solution in formaldehyde, 1% soaks of formalin are used for treatment of hyperhidrosis of feet, but they are unsuitable for hands and axilla. Then glutaraldehyde 10% help in patients but stain the skin. And there is a small risk of allergic sensitization to both formaldehyde and to glutaraldehyde. For axillary hyperhidrosis, the most common solution is aluminium or zirconium salts, which are part of many deodorants. Improved result with 20% aluminium chloride in absolute ethanol. On hand and feet, it is less successful. Then the iontophoresis. One of the most satisfactory methods of controlling hyperhidrosis of hand and feet is by iontophoresis, by using tap water or anticholinergic drugs like 0.05% glycopyronium bromide solution. Then direct current is used on each palm and sole being treated for 30 minutes with 20 milliampere current three times a week. Once control is achieved, 
a single treatment may prove effective for some weeks. A small battery-operated home unit can be purchased as a maintenance therapy. So this is a ionophoresis device. It is not very expensive and it is available um, easily in the market. Botulinum toxin injection. This compound produces prolonged blockade of neuronal, neuronal acetylcholine released at the cholinergic nerve autonomic neurons. 0.1 ml of approximately diluted Botulinum toxin is administered as an intradermal injection to one centimeter square area. The usually the protocol is to dilute 100 unit of botulinum toxin in 4 ml of normal saline, and then this injection is suitable for either both palms or for both feet or for both axilla. Each axillary unit requires 12 injections and hand and feet about 20 pricks. The reduction in sweating is apparent in 48 hours and the full beneficial effect may persist for 8 months in axillary and 6 months for palmar and craniofacial hyperhidrosis. A transient reduction of thenar and hypothenar muscle power is a minor problem after the palmar injection. So these are the main points and mainly the sweating is seen at the distal and middle interphalangeal joints. Then the systemic drug treatments. Atropine-like drugs have been used to block the effect of acetylcholine on the sweat glands, but their side effects are so much which precludes their use. And the side effects include dryness of mouth, constipation, urinary retention, and disturbance of vision, and more side effects like glaucoma, hyperthermia, and convulsions. The oral antimuscarinic drugs like oxybutynin is more effective and safer, which is used to treat the bladder instability and is effective in generalized and focal hyperhidrosis. And the dose escalation from 2.5 mg daily to 5 mg twice a daily is better tolerated and improve the quality of life in 65% of those treated. Then clonidine in a dose of 0.1 mg BD is useful but hypertension is the limiting factor. Then calcium channel blocker like deltaism help in some patients. If there is a pronounced emotional sweating, then tranquilizers may be used. Surgical treatment, sympathectomy. Whether cervical, transaxillary, or endoscopic. The cause anhydrosis, if incomplete, sweating may return after a period of some years due to regeneration of sympathetic fibers. The former open approach is largely replaced by the endoscopic procedure. Interruption of sympathetic fibers between second and fourth thoracic ganglion can be achieved by surgical trans transection, radiofrequency ablation, phenol destruction, cautery, clamping, or clipping. With both open and endoscopic approaches, satisfactory reduction in palmar hyperhidrosis is achieved in 95% of the cases. Complications. Hemothorax, pneumothorax, chylothorax, nipple sensitivity, and Horner syndrome. There are rare incidences of transient or permanent bradycardia. Palm and soles become excessively dry with irritant eczema reported. The abolition of severe facial blushing may be a desirable consequence. And resolution of palmar eczema is reported after endoscopic sympathectomy. The pedal sympathetic, sympathetic denervation requires lumbar sympathectomy. And if more cranial lumbar ganglions are removed, uh, ejaculatory impotence may occur. So this is a risky operation. Excision of the axillary vault. Excision of the whole axillary vault will remove all the sweat glands and cure axillary hyperhidrosis, but it is definitely a bigger operation. Variation of the technique includes subcutaneous curettage of the axillary skin, directly trimming the acrine glands and tumescent liposuction of the axilla. So the treatment ladder approach in hyperhidrosis, first line is the acrine duct blocking agents like aluminum chloride, hexahydrate, and topical anticholinergics like glycopyrrolate. Second line is iontophoresis, intradermal botulinum toxin, 
then the oral anticholinergics like uh, propenthaline, propenthaline, methylene oxybutynin, and glycopyrrolate, oral clonidine, oral beta blockers, and anxiolytics. Third line comes the removal and ablation of eccrine glands, axillary or sympathetic. Then a few assorted conditions which are associated with hyperhidrosis, the granulosis rubra nasi, which is a rare disorder characterized by hyperhidrosis of nose and associated skin. There is some evidence of autonomic dominant transmission. Symptoms develop from as early as six months, but may occur at any age. Initial presentation is with excessive sweating localized over the tip of the nose. Droplets of sweat are usually visible. With time, erythema, papule, vesicle, and telangiectasias develop over the nose, cheek, and upper lip. And in majority of cases, resolution occurs around puberty. Management is best by botulinum toxin. This is granulosa rubrae nasi. Then anhydrosis or hypohydrosis. Diminishing sweat production may be partial hypohydrosis or complete anhydrosis. Disturbance of any part of the physio philo physiological, pa um, physio uh, physiological pathway of sweat production may decrease sweating. Cases may be broadly classified as being either of neurological or eccrine gland origin. So neurological causes of anhydrosis or hypohydrosis. They can be organic brain lesions of hypothalamus, pons, and medulla. Then spinal cord lesions like syringomyelia or sympathectomy. Then congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. Some degenerative syndromes like Ross syndrome and shy Dreger syndrome. Then peripheral neuropathies like diabetes, alcohol, and leprosy. Autonomic neuropathies and drug-induced blockade of neurotransmission like ganglion-blocking drugs, like anticholinergic drugs, calcium channel blocking agents, and alpha adrenergic blockers. Then those conditions in which the eccrine glands is the cause of anhydrosis and hypohydrosis. The genetic disorders like basic syndrome, the ectodermal dysplasias, febrile disease, and incontinentia pigmentae. Atrophy and destruction of eccrine glands occur in scleroderma, in burns, in Joggin syndrome, in lymphomas, in acrodermatitis chronica atrophicans. Obstruction of sweat ducts occur in miliaria, eczema, psoriasis, lycopenis, ichthyosis, and porocarotis. Drugs that affect eccrine functions are the topical aluminum salt, 5 fluorouracil mepacrine, and top topiramate. An idiopathic condition is the acquired idiopathic generalized hypo and hydrosis. This impairment of sweating interferes with body temperature control mechanism and producing symptoms like heat intolerance, fatigue, drowsiness, and pyrexia. In severe cases, death may result. Examination of patient with hypo and hydrosis is often unremarkable. Skin biopsy is helpful to identify Eccrine sweat gland abnormality. So the glands are absent. Ross syndrome. Ross syndrome is a rare syndrome that is characterized by a triad of segmental anhydrosis, tonic pupils, and absent deep tendon reflexes. It's a progressive degenerative disorder of sensory and autonomic nerves. Main symptoms are heat intolerance because of anhydrosis and soci socially disabling compensatory hyperhidrosis that is asymmetrical, patchy, or unilateral. Hyperhidrosis arise in this situation is successfully treated by iontophoresis and botulinum toxin. So this is a uh, hypertonic uh, pupil and skin changes. Acquired idiopathic generalized anhydrosis is a heterogeneous group of Rare disorder characterized by progressive loss of sweating and heat intolerance. There are three subtypes, idiopathic, pure, uh, pseudomotor, uh, pseudomotor uh, failure, pseudomotor neuropathy, and sweat gland failure. The proportion of patients' lymphocytic infiltration of eccrine gland is seen 
and such inflammation is explained as a response to co-oral corticosteroids which improve these conditions. So this brings to end of this lecture. I thank you all for a very patient listening and I would like to see you next time with the part two of the same topic that is disorders of shirt gland. Thank you and have a good day.